In this edition of I Escaped, a convicted murderer determined to break out mails himself to freedom. You'd have done wrong by now. <laughs> and a female guard springs her lover, and they go on a shooting spree. He's a bit of a white guy. Pretty good. And still is for that matter. Around the world, over 9 million prisoners are behind bars. These are the stories of the few who dared to break out. Pollock Federal Penitentiary, Louisiana, a high-security fortress with 1,500 of America's most dangerous prisoners caged behind its bars. Surrounded on all sides by the dense Katachi forest, no one had ever escaped. But in April 2006, cold-blooded killer Richard Lee McNair was bent on being the first. This smooth-talking, two-faced charmer was a consummate con man. He'd worked both sides of the law as an undercover drug buyer for the police and a petty thief until killing a truck driver in a heist gone wrong. At that point, he went from being a two-bit thief to being a cold-blooded murderer. McNair was handed three life sentences for armed robbery, attempted murder, and murder. When convicted, McNair was serving as a sergeant in the United States Air Force, trained in martial arts, survival skills, and the art of escape. All prisoners who are serving a life from imprisonment uh, think about escaping. Uh, Mr. McNair just has the knowledge and the drive and the willingness to do so. In one attempt, he used stolen lip balm to slide out of handcuffs. Then they put him in the Bismarck jail. And that's where, you know, after a few years, he and a bunch of guys in Bible study, they decide that they're gonna escape through the roof. So he escapes through the ventilation system, crawls all the way through, gets out to the roof of the prison, jumps off, takes off running, wasn't seen for nine and a half months. Incarcerated again, McNair's attention was once again focused on breaking out. Through the process, the Freedom of Information Act was able to obtain all the documents, all the materials on his second escape, and even on his first escape, to learn what he did wrong so he wouldn't repeat the same mistakes again. McNair came up with a radical plan. He charmed his way into a skills training program for inmates. His job? Repairing mailbags. They had checks, yes. They were checking on their, their prisoners. They were keeping good, you know, a good track of them, of course. But at the end of the day, he found the weakest link in the system. In all of my experience of working on criminal cases over the last decade, Richard McNair is by far the most cunning and intelligent criminal out there. His daring plan, shrink wrap himself inside a mailbag, then get shipped to freedom. A plan filled with danger and requiring him to be extremely fit. He's also trained uh, himself in physical fitness. He ran for days and months and uh, to a point uh, running three hours a day. McNair's job gave him access to delivery times and destinations, but it didn't give him access to a container big enough to hide in. He needed to make one. He created this escape pod, is what we like to call it. And he it was basically stacked with mailbags all around it. Now, on the morning of his escape, he finds an orange pallet for the base of the pod, puts it in the middle of his work area. Then he gets the frame of a cart and sticks it on top. Walks around to the middle and squats down Indian style. How he did this part, I don't know, because the man is six foot tall. Then, gets a plastic container and sticks it over top of his head. And what the U.S. Marshals believe, he did have help inside of the prison. Because there's no way in the world he's going to be able to cover himself up with mailbags, shrink wrap himself into this pod, and be lifted off site. McNair planned everything down to the last detail. He was um, pulling things in over time, things that he could tape onto his body. He would duct tape power bars and, and protein shakes and things like that onto his body. Once McNair is squeezed into the pod, his accomplices seal him with plastic wrap. I don't know how McNair did this. I can barely breathe. 
I can barely move in here. I mean, I'm five foot four. McNair is six foot, 200 pounds. McNair sits in his shrink-wrapped escape pod waiting for the mail truck. With temperatures nearing 90 degrees, can he survive? April 5th, 2006, Pollock Federal Penitentiary, Louisiana. Shrink wrapped in a pallet of mail bags, Richard Lee McNair is sweltering in 90 degree heat, waiting for his special delivery out of jail. I would say it took years of planning for him to come up with this kind of escape to be able to escape out of a maximum security prison in the United States. At 9 a.m., the pallet of bags with McNair inside is lifted onto a truck and taken to a warehouse less than a mile outside the prison gates. At approximately um, 11 o'clock, they, they did a head count of all prisoners within the USP uh, Pollock Penitentiary and discovered they had one short. Meanwhile, in the warehouse, McNair is hacking his way out of his shrink rep cocoon. I believe he was in there probably three to four hours before he was able to cut himself out. After freeing himself from his escape pod, McNair slips out of the warehouse undetected and runs for his life. Eight miles into his newfound freedom, McNair is stopped by a state trooper while running along railway tracks. Do you have any form of identification on you? No, man. What's your name? Robert Jones. What is? We got an escapee. Oh. <laughs> Where from? Uh, a prison. There's a prison here? Yeah. <laughs> Smooth talking McNair claims he is just an innocent jogger. He tells a good story and uh, he makes it believable. And he was able to give some geographical areas that uh, the officer was familiar with. And he was also able to uh, kind of, uh, again, just disarm this officer and believe that he was not a prisoner escapee because of his. Uh, I guess, calming attitude. Amazingly, experienced officer Carl Bordelan believes McNair's story. Carl knew that there may be a prison escapee, but he didn't have a lot of information. And with what he had, he did the best that he could interviewing this guy. No, 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 no
to cut the distance of him and I uh, I tagged in I tagged him on the ground. He said, let me catch my breath. He repeated that uh, a couple of times. Um, and uh, there he said, uh, he said, you guys got a big fish. He said, I'm uh, Richard Lee McNair, a convicted uh, uh, murderer from the U.S. and I escaped from jail. After eluding capture for 18 months, Richard Lee McNair finally lost the game he played so well. He was reincarcerated to serve his three life sentences plus an extra two and a half years for his prison break. Coming up, unfortunate circumstances force a prison guard to break her lover out and go on the run. Melbourne, Australia, 1993. 275 male inmates are locked up in a new state-of-the-art facility in the heart of the city's business district. Inside, 38-year-old Peter Robert Gibb, in and out of jail for the last 20 years. Peter's, Peter's a bit of a wacko, Peter Gibb, and still is for that matter. Gibb's latest sentence was 12 years for the armed robbery of an armored car on Valentine's Day, 1991. He was a fairly hardened and experienced criminal. But even hardened criminals have a softer side. His was 28-year-old mother of two, prison officer Heather Parker, whose marriage was on the rocks. Well, at first I didn't notice him. I mean, a prisoner's a prisoner, you know, that kind of thing. Back in 1992, a fellow prison officer found the door to a linen closet in the prison was locked. When the closet was finally opened, a red-faced Heather Parker came out, followed by Peter Gibb. I found the right man. It's just unfortunate circumstances around us have made it very difficult. The scandal rocked the corrections department. They didn't want her to work in the prison. They didn't want to work with her, and the, the, the organization had to transfer to another another area of the of corrections. Heather was sent to work at correctional headquarters in South Melbourne. Contact with Gibb was forbidden, but love struck Heather Parker was desperate. Her new job gave her access to restricted files that revealed the prison secrets. Knowing it would be the end of her career, Parker hatched a plan to break out her jailbird boyfriend. If you look at prisons, generally there's bars on windows, and uh, with that prison, there was no bars on the windows. Neither was there any razor ribbon around the perimeter. Instead, the Melbourne prison relied on bullet-resistant polycarbonate windows. Heather saw this as a weak point. Banned from seeing each other, Parker and Gibb recruited career criminal Archie Butterly to act as their go-between and help pull off the breakout. On March 7th, 1993, during a prison boxing match, Peter and Archie make their move. It's speculated that the, the, in the boxing tournament, that when, when the equipment came in, one of the mouth guards was actually plastic explosive. As Butterly keeps watch for passing guards, Gibb sticks the plastic explosive to the window. A deafening explosion rocks the building as the bulletproof glass shatters. Gibb, dazed but desperate to escape, knocks out the remains of the window with his feet. With the whole prison now on full alert, they have only seconds to make their getaway. They use bed sheets to lie themselves through the window and, and down onto the, onto the ground. Gibb and Butterly race to the getaway car and grab the loaded revolver left by Parker before speeding into traffic. 60 seconds in, their high-speed escape turns into a demolition derby. Gibb smashes into another car. And without stopping, he crashes into the entrance of the freeway. Armed and dangerous, both escapees attempt to force a motorcyclist from his bike. Next 
thing, I saw a police car come racing up the road here and the guy got his baton out and went running out to, up to the guys on the bike. One guy hopped off the bike, turned around and shot him a few times. Then we've got a report of a member down. We've had a member shot. Officer Trellor has been shot twice in the chest. The other policeman dived for cover and returned fire. But the two prisoners managed to escape in the police car. Police believe one of the men is injured, possibly shot. As they escape in the stolen police car, Gibb and Butterly are desperate to rendezvous with accomplice Heather Parker. 30 detectives have taken part in raids on homes of known accomplices across Melbourne, but so far there have been no confirmed sightings of the two escapees. Gibb and Butterly dump the police vehicle at Riverside Quay, where the witnesses see them meet up with Parker. They were driven away by a woman in a black Suzuki Vitara four-wheel drive with the number plate DYV969. The lovers are finally reunited, but the escape has turned ugly, and the worst is still to come. Melbourne, 1993. With the help of prison officer Heather Parker, Peter Gibb and Archie Butterly have just escaped custody. We've got a report from a member down. We've had a member shot. They've shot a policeman, stole a police car, rendezvoused with Heather Parker, and disappeared. After five days on the run, Gibb and Parker arrive at the remote Gaffney Creek Hotel, 120 miles north of Melbourne. I was rather surprised at, uh, at the, the, the arrival of this unusual looking fellow. He had his arm in a sling. He had no socks on, but a pair of shoes. He wanted accommodation for the night for himself and his wife and his young son. The badly injured Archie Butterly hides in their room while Gibb and Parker do their best to fit in with the locals. And I said, oh, please, come on have and join in with us. We were having a good time. So they ordered a meal, and I said, would you like me to take uh, fish and chips down to the child in the room? And they said, oh, no, 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 well, I'll take it down, but he's not having the fish and chips, he's having the steak, which I thought was unusual, but uh, you get lots of unusual things happening in Gaffney's Creek. Bill Gribble's suspicions intensify when Gibb purchases too much alcohol for a couple and their young son. And that was really the last I saw them. 6 a.m. the next morning. I heard shouting that I awoke to, and uh, I heard a voice saying, Bill, you've got a fire. Police were tipped off to the escapee's whereabouts after the Gaffney's Creek pub burnt to the ground last night. The escapees had checked into the hotel. The trio had vanished again, this time into the vast wilderness of the Australian bush. Very remote part of the state, very hilly, uh, with thick uh, trees and uh, steep tracks and roads. It's a very difficult place to... Uh, to search. We looked around for two or three days, couldn't find them there. There's a pretty big uh, police contingent up there. But then, a lucky break. A couple on a fishing trip report a vehicle hidden in the brush. With one cop already having been shot, the police are taking no chances. They split up and start combing the area. Dog handler Trevor Berryman heads straight to the river. The dog actually stopped at the end of the beach and put its nose in the air. And he's just, Trevor's gone, I'm pulling the dog back. Um, someone's really close by. I've seen flashes coming from the bush in front of me. I thought, oh, someone's shooting at me. In a hail of bullets, Gibb, Parker and Butterly open fire on the police. I felt the air of the bullets go past my head. Well, I basically kept firing all the way into the river, and by the time I actually got to the water, I was out of ammunition. Still dodging the fugitive's bullets, Dave Empey jumps in the river. Pulled the magazine off and reloaded, and then came up out of the water and started firing again. Empey fires off two more magazines, 60 bullets. All I could think was, I can't see them. I know where the shots roughly came from. If I can put enough 
rounds into that position, maybe I'll hit one of them. The firefight lasted over half an hour. When the backup team arrives, stun grenades are tossed into the bush. Hearing nothing, a dog is sent in. When he returns, he's covered in blood. We thought, well, there's someone in there. They're, they're, they're either there and not that well or there and dead. Butterly was dead. Forensic test would reveal he was not killed by a police bullet. My guess is that one of the other two fired at us and one of the other two shot him. But Gibb and Parker were still on the loose. So the police surrounded the area and quickly cornered the fugitives. Peter Gibb and warder Heather Parker have been formally charged with attempted murder and numerous other offences following the dramatic shootout with police in northeastern Victoria. Peter Gibb was sentenced to eight years for his offences. Heather Parker got five. But in an ironic twist, lovers' luck would favour them again. Gibb was acquitted of the armed robbery for which he had received his initial 12-year sentence. It meant he was out of jail six months ahead of Heather Parker. These once locked up lovers still live in Melbourne. And today, are the parents of two young sons.